We have a very interesting subject this morning, and those of you who are acquainted with the tarot cards will remember number nine, the hermit, who with a very heavy cloak, he is protecting the light in a little lantern. And this has become a symbol that has been used down through the ages to represent the transmission of the light of truth. At the end of the first uh, chapter in the, six, in the uh, 1640 edition of Advancement and Proficiency of Learning, uh, Lord Bacon mentions the lamp of tradition, and he calls this lamp the method, which is to be transmitted from generation to generation for the preservation of mankind. Now, all these symbols and interesting sidelines remind us of Lord Bacon's personal uh, philosophy of life. He had the attitude, which uh, is proper, I think, to most philosophical thinkers, that the final proof of the pudding is always in the eating, and that no matter how many theories and how many attitudes and ideas are promulgated, the problem is, do they work? Are they accomplishing the purpose for which they were intended? If they are not, then something is essentially wrong. Bacon occasionally fell into a uh, debate with Aristotle, but he used him on some occasions when needs were in that direction, because he believed definitely that there were three ways of achieving what we might call the state of wisdom, namely through tradition, through observation, and through experimentation. These were the three methods or the three parts of the great method of the lamp that must be carried on from generation to generation. There is no way of establishing a truth in its original and basic nature except by an estimation of its consequences. That is true which always results in good. That is doubtful which often results in that which is not good. Any pro process or formula that ends in frustration is not true, even though it may have the authority of ages. So Bacon took the attitude that you had to use experimentation to verify observation, and that both observation and uh, experimentation were largely involved with the analysis of tradition. We have brought down to us from the past many different systems of thought, many philosophies, arts and sciences, systems of different kinds. We have created a variety of convictions of our own things we believe, things we think are true. We do the same with personal affairs of living. We do the things that we believe we should do or we want to do. Now, there is a great division between what we should do and what we want to do. And to tell which is which, finally, it has to be through experimentation. The whole life of the individual is a series of experiments a series of adventures, we can say, by which a certain conviction is estimated through its consequences. And this is what uh, Bacon was most concerned with. The abstract aspects of things are interesting, but not necessary. That which is necessary is that the individual shall discern the difference between truth and error that he shall have the courage to live what he knows to be true. And this courage is largely strengthened by certainty, where the individual rationalizing his own conduct is convinced that he is working from a basic principle that is correct, has greater strength of character, greater resolution, and greater result than those who are simply trying to find out and have no solid foundation in thoughtfulness. Buddha had much the same idea on this matter, because to him also the primary purpose was that the human being 
should fulfill the destiny for which he was intended. That mankind must, in the course of ages, come to live according to truth, according to law, according to what was called the doctrine of the sapienza, or the doctrine of wisdom. So we have here uh, the very interesting problem of the carrying on of the lamp, which is passed from one generation to another. This lamp is knowledge. It is also the tremendous strength and power of tradition. We have all inherited many wonderful things from the past. And these different things give us all kinds of ideas if we use them correctly. We do not perpetuate the past simply because it is past. We do not venerate everything that has gone before. We may have to discard many aspects of knowledge which we have clung to. But in all cases, the past provides the experimentations, the observations, and the reflections upon which we must build. It is useless to say that any generation is a structure in itself with no reference to past or future. All forms of life and knowledge are a stream flowing down through ages of human experimentation. Now somewhere in the very remote pace, for instance, the Phoenicians invented money. Now, that was a major invention. Up to that time, people had to carry the products and bottle them. If you wanted a cow, you had to take the cow home and give something in exchange for it, maybe a couple of sheep. Well, this was really rather tedious, especially as the interests of life broadened. So a barter system was established. And the barter system was intended, from all ancient accounts, from the beginning of time for one purpose only, to simplify exchange. It was to enable the individual to accomplish certain transactions without uh, unwieldy or impossible circumstances. There was never a time in the beginning of the matter when the creation of currency was intended to be the basis of profit in itself. In other words, antiqui antiquity did not have the idea, uh, uh, certainly in Sparta there was no such an idea, that uh, money was business in itself. It was a medium of exchange. And as gradually time went on, this medium of exchange, which was necessary, has proven not to be a convenience, but a tremendous inconvenience. It has gradually resulted in the perversion of most human activities. Until today, we are hopelessly enslaved in what is called the profit system. This was not the intention, but a convenience has become a monster. Now, if going down through the ages, we became aware of this, by the 20th century, the present century, we, we would have done something about it. We would have corrected the mistake because we would have seen the tragedy all the way down through history, all the way down through human experience and spread out before us in contemporary affairs. But we do nothing about it. Here is a lesson to be learned and great reluctance on the part of humanity to learn the lesson. We want to keep the problem as it is. The only thing we want to do is to take the unpleasantness out of it. We want to be able to have what we want without causing consequences that are tragic. But Bacon's point of view on this would be very definite. If you'll find through the cons conservative estimates of all peoples that a certain procedure is dangerous, then you correct it. If you do not correct it, you are not wise, nor strong enough, nor righteous enough to do anything about it. So all kinds of things come along, language, art, music, literature, philosophy, statesmanship, medicine, in which we have received into this generation 
a great traditional wealth, a wealth by which we should be able to solve most human problems at the present time. But somewhere along the line, something happened in which this descent of knowledge has become more perilous than ignorance. In fact, it has become a highly specialized ignorance that could be fatal to the survival of the human race. Now, this is where we have to take a consideration of the lamp of wisdom. In other words, we have to rescue from this dilemma that we have put ourselves into through the consideration of the endowments of the past, the values of the past, and the experiences through which we have gone for thousands of years. A failure to do this becomes defeat, and defeat in our time is perilous. Now, some will say, and try, have tried to say, that this is a different generation, that we can do now successfully things that we would have considered bad a few years ago. But Bacon was concerned with the terms good and bad, very basically. Anything which in its consequence is not good is bad. Anything by means of which the problems humanity of humanity are complicated, made more dangerous, is not good. Science, for example, has finally handed us nuclear physics. This is not good. All the experimentation, all the tossing about of honors, all the discussion of the great progress we make, all these terms are meaningless if the end product of a certain system or stream of tradition is misery, danger, and uh, cause for continuing anxiety. We have also gradually come, as Bacon points out, to a, fair, a place where decisions have to be made. What are we here to do? Why are we here in the first place? Is there any reason for us? Or are we simply one of those biological phenomena that exist in nature? Or is there such a thing as a biological exper experiment in nature? Is everything intended? Is everything lawful, reasonable, organized, and inevitable? Then we are making series of mis serious mistakes. Out of the past, as Bacon also pointed out, we have one tremendously valuable heritage, and that is religion. Religion is a science or an art of right and wrong. It is that which tells us what we should do and what we should not do. Now, this uh, religious descent, however, has gradually be become complicated. A great deal is included in religion today that is not religious. A great deal is included in theology which has no foundation in basic theological concepts. We have gradually commercialized religion as everything else, and also in the process of so doing have committed one very serious error, and that is we have continued to maintain the structure of theology but have disregarded its moral advice. To Bacon, religion was a system of morality. It was an ethic without which we cannot survive. Therefore, from the whole descent of religion from the earliest time to now, we have a great panorama of man's search for spiritual integrity. We know what has gone before. We know the mistakes that have been made. We recognize the revelations and the revolutions that have arisen in religion. And we say to ourselves, religion is a science for human perfection. Why then is it constantly uh, involved in bickering and in many instances violent crime? Why do we commit crimes in the name of religion? Why do we destroy in the name of truth? Why do we deform in the name of beauty? All these things add up to a matter of consideration. And that most of our consideration at the moment deals with that part of our own nature uh, which with, with which we are dominated. The human being, the average person, is moved by certain pressures within himself. These pressures 
are not very strong when he comes into the world. But as he's here longer, the pressures increase within himself and are pressed against him from outside sources of one kind and another. So that gradually, what we call education today, fits the individual to perpetuate the miseries and misfortunes of the ages. He is taught to do what everyone has done, but he has not been shown that everyone who did it failed. This has been one of the great problems. The belief that many people still gloriously maintain that they are going to be exceptions. Other people are punished for their mistakes, but we won't be. There is a certain interior absoluteness in our own nature which gets in the way of our integrity time and time again. But if we become more thoughtful, if we decide to make what Plotinus called philosophy our journey, then we begin to study these different factors to find out what we are doing to ourselves or for ourselves and making such decisions as seem advisable. I think one of the most important things that we have to realize, and which may be slowly appearing to us, is that we are not improved by acceptance or rejections alone. We can accept the Bible, but this does not make us religious. It simply provides us with a textbook by which many generations have been benefited and which also has been used in many cases to harm and injure uh, believers and unbelievers. But we are not good because we accept it. We are not Christians because we are baptized. We are not Buddhists because we live in Asia. These things are secondary and tertiary factors. The main problem, as Bacon points out, is the life of wisdom is not to be perfected by reading good books. It is not by being a, an Aristotelian or a follower of Nietzsche or Schopenhauer that we become wise. All these systems do not do anything for us unless they are taken into consciousness and used to change conduct. In other words, religion is a matter of conduct. It is a matter of relationships. And we find in time and time again that the religious person does not realize that there is any inconsistency in claiming to be deeply spiritual and at the same time living a life largely based upon selfishness and exploitation. We believe in Christianity, but we lose our tempers. We do not love our neighbors. We do not do good to those who despitefully use us. We are not serving truth or principles. We are belonging to something, but we are not of it. And one of the reasons of, for this is that religions have not failed man nearly as much as man has failed religions. But here again, we come to the philosophical life as it's expounded by Bacon. The philosophic method is not something that can be merely educated into existence. The individual can go to the university, major in philosophy, take up Baconian studies, and become proficient in all of the phases of the Baconian method, and still will not be a son of wisdom. He will not be a person whose life has changed materially and basically so far as morality and ethics are concerned. So we find individuals practicing professions uh, and exploiting these professions and still regarding it, this exploitation, as perfectly right and normal. Or, if there is a small qualm of conscience somewhere, it may not be right, but it is inevitable, and unless you do it, you will be a failure. So the uh, problem of trying to reform society and build it into a better pattern depends upon the human being's personal acceptance of the responsibility of right conduct. There is no possible way that political conditions, psychological factors can be adjusted correctly unless integrity rules the relationships of people. 
they must be right motivated. And selfishness is never basically a right motivation. Now, scientifically speaking, we accept Bacon as one of the founders of science. And what is science? Science is presumably an exact methodology. It is a system of conduct or belief that is based upon constant experimentation and a continual observation of the facts of life. Well, selfishness is not without its obvious evidences. We have a problem, for instance, of integrities. Selfishness has gone on uncorrected from the beginning of time. Now, if we want to find out how to adjust this or change this, we have to recognize selfishness as a scientific problem that must be solved. The individual must learn that selfishness is detrimental. He must learn it more quickly and better, perhaps, than he needs to understand the rotation of planets. He needs much more to the major, major variations and improvements in personal conduct than he requires a study of the holes in space. It is not those holes out there that are giving us the big trouble. It's the holes between our own ears that are getting into <laughs> most of the problems that we suffer from. And yet, science will not accept morality as scientific. This is the important point. It can be proven just as completely as the law of gravity. But because the proof is rationalizing rather than merely physical phenomena, it is not accepted. And yet we can prove scientifically what causes the troubles we're in. We can prove scientifically that these causes could be changed because any problem that we know can be altered. It is ignorance or complete lack of knowledge that makes a problem difficult of solution. But we all know what is wrong. We've known it for a long time. And as long as we endure it, the system of education, the systems of science, all of the moral influences that we have, all the great examples of the past, are inadequate if they do not change the personal conduct of the person alive today. He must in some way find the answer for himself. Now, we have many beautiful books, many great philosophies, many great thoughts to go by. We have all over the world the uh, sacred traditions of those who have lived well. They are the sons of wisdom. They are the bearers of the lamp. The lamp, therefore, is the light of inner truth. It is the light within ourselves which causes us to live according to, to actual realities. It is the light of inside spiritual soul power. It is that part of our nature which cannot be contaminated, but can simply be left dormant until we do something about it. Now, if we don't do something about these things, what is the result? The continuance of the thing as it is. Only things that are changed can be different. Only when the time comes that the individual takes a positive step in the direction of improving his own character will this character improve. So we now notice a long group of new organizations coming into existence. Organizations which are definitely de 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 desirous of assisting the modernization of integrities. That we shall find new ways of doing things better. We have to face these changes, but the, everywhere we cannot face them with platitudes. We cannot assemble simply in order to hold constructive ideas that are inconsistent with personal conduct. Conduct is the basis of morality and ethics. Conduct is the essential principle behind karma. It is what we do and not what we think about that changes our lives. The hope is that the inside part of ourselves will demand these changes 
and that we will come near enough to the, in, to the evolution of our inner lives that the in li inner life will begin to dominate external circumstances. Up to the present time, the inner life has been blocked by the appetites of the mortal or material culture. We have sacrificed our own integrity for benefits which are now proving to be very dangerous. So with Bacon, we have this passing on of the lamp, the idea that there has been since the beginning of time in this world groups of people who have known the facts. Various terms have been given to them. Uh, Muhammad recalled, the, uh, recalled these folk people when he spoke of the primordial sages of the world. In various religions, they appear. They represent mysterious, po po powerful factors that have dominated life. In most cases, these original sages, if we might call them that, have had very quiet lives and sometimes have been bitterly persecuted. The better these people have become, the more they have taught, the more they have sacrificed, the more they have been ridiculed and persecuted. But the fact remains that no amount of ridicule can change a fact, nor make an untruth true. So back in those times where uh, Bacon is talking about the sons of wisdom, there were these sacred mysteries, these schools, these esoteric bodies that existed to perpetuate the inner truths of life. Now many people are unhappy because these organizations had a tendency to, what, to be what we have termed as exclusive. We feel that, many people at least feel, that these organizations have gone on nurturing a few favored persons and allowed the world as itself to go along as it was. That these institutions have not opened themselves to the common needs of the common people. It was the idea that these should be parental organizations that simply descended and took care of the needs of everybody. But such was not possible and such was not the intent. It was what was hoped would prove to be a, a, a permanent motion in society toward which those who were concerned with a better way of life could progress gradually to the understanding of basic principles. If wisdom is bestowed upon those morally unfit, it will become a very serious form of black magic. It becomes a terror and a danger. The more skillful we become, the more dangerous we become, unless we control skill with wisdom, love, and truth. No skill is safe unless the person possessing it is morally integrated. No uh, skill can go along continually serving mankind usefully unless those possessing the, that skill do not abuse it, do not misuse it, and do not sacrifice the common good for personal profit or advantage. So a profit system has come in by means of which the wisdom of the ages has been tempered down to the point where individuals can benefit materially from rules, principles, and laws that they are supposed to apply to the inner daily life of their conscience and their integrities. So we have all these things as the problems of the day, and we know these problems exist. Now we have five or six very great problems on our hands at the moment. These problems are not new. We've always had them. But congestion and population problems and various uh, advancements in skills have made these problems increasingly dangerous. Until today, nearly every phase of our lives has been, has been in, uh, exploited. We are constantly lived in the midst of, live our lives in the midst of dangers. Uh, in which our fellow human beings become deadly enemies or very strange monsters of a jungle. This is why we now have to take the first basic step, of, as Bacon gave it in his uh, passing on of the lamp. The first step is to be capable 
of using knowledge without abuse. We have to know we were here to learn. It is our moral privilege and duty to improve ourselves every way that we can. But knowledge must not hold out the bait of self-aggrandizement. We cannot accumulate knowledge primarily for the purpose of profit. And it is true, as it says in the scriptures, that it doesn't profit anyone anything if in the use of things he loses his own soul. Now, the profit system has damaged every art, every science, every trade that we know. It has now become a matter of simple working for a fixed profit, which has nothing to do with character. To attain that profit, we may break homes, we may leave children orphaned, we may start wars that kill off half the population of a country. But these things have nothing to do with growth. They are simply proof of mental and moral sickness. And this, this continues too long. This sickness spreads like a plague until whole institutions and nations are destroyed. So the profit problem is definitely that the individual must learn to transfer his allegiance from profit to principle. Uh, the uh, time was when selfishness wasn't very important because there wasn't much to be selfish about that meant anything. There was little outbreaks of bad disposition, but the average person did not have incentives, did not have examples which led him into great errors. But now it is all different. And we have this very simple thing to face, namely that wisdom has to be mysteriously earned. It has to be brought out of its mystery into the light of ordinary living by means of persons who are dedicated to the transmission of the lamp. They have to be individuals who have outgrown the common faults with which we are all suffering. If we look around now, we see fear developing in many parts of the world. We find a, a desperate grasping after something better, after a way of life that is more endurable and more purposeful. We also see the mistakes getting bigger and bigger. We see ourselves overshadowed by things we started, but we don't know how to finish. We also realize that behind all of these things, there was selfishness, cupidity, inordinate ambition, and uncontrolled appetites. Well, a human being has to grow up, and the time is coming when if he doesn't grow of his own accord, growth will be thrust upon him by disaster. This is not good to think about, but it is also true that the individual who is right also has a strange and wonderful protection. It is not, uh, there is no exaggeration in the biblical concept that many may perish on one side and many on the other, but the just person shall not be moved. And we are beginning to realize that there is a strange kind of internal justice. And at the moment, many groups and individuals all over the world are reaching out to find the formula for this justice, to find out what it is that can bring the individual out of the dilemma and at the same time give him the incentives to a better way of life. This thought is also carried on by Bacon when he turns from the lamp to the New Atlantis. The New Atlantis is a symbol of a commonwealth based much upon more, and Ray and many others, but a symbol of a world properly governed, a world in which there will always be room for everyone, where overpopulation will not exist, where crime will be reduced to a minimum, and where an individual shall, will be honored for his integrities rather than his possessions. Also, we find constant temptations, most of them arising from the prophet concept. 
nearly every major fault we have today has been exaggerated because it was financially advantageous to somebody. And gradually, uh, finances have taken over. And I remember the fable that find in Stanley's History of Philosophy, where someone was talking with a philosopher. And he said, why is it uh, that great wealthy people feed the hungry and the poor and the sick, but never do anything to help the wise? And Plato replied, it's very simple. They're all afraid they may be sick and hungry someday themselves, but they are not afraid that they will be wise. <laughs> and this is more or less the problem that we have. Today we have everything necessary except the proper motives and the proper incentives. We have a religion that teaches the brotherhood of human beings and very little brotherhood. We have a religion that teaches us to love God and serve our fellow man. Both in, tra in both cases, the practice is inadequate. So gradually, we are being forced by time and by nature to discover that the things that we are trying to do will not, not work and are not worth the price. We must learn that we are saving the wrong things that we are not doing that which is going to permanently improve ourselves or anyone else. We are simply signing our own death warrants. This uh, gradually comes into focus. Now, the difficulty is not so terrible. It's amazing to realize that the solution is not in the skies or in the stars or in anything else. The solution is in the common sense of personal living. It's here, it has always has been here. It's a very common thing. We find good homes and we admire them. The parents are good people. The children grow up in a good environment. It's very wonderful. But no one really seems to say this must be the way it must be done. These people are exceptions. They're honored, but not emulated. And as a result of that, in many homes, Selfish parents are neglecting their children. Badly raised children are becoming potential dangers to the environment. And everything goes along as it is. Why? Usually because of financial advantage. Usually because someone wants more luxuries, more privileges, and more liberties, but not more insights. This is, goes along in every walk of life. Great corporations are folding up every day. Nations are going bankrupt. Sickness is widespread. We are in worse condition now in many ways than we have been in a very long time. But nobody thinks of doing anything to get to the source of it. We are going to elect somebody else, but we are not going to do what they suggest, if they suggest right. And if they don't suggest right, there was no use electing them in the first place. But we are not making the personal changes. We are not forgiving our enemies. We are not getting over family grievances. We are still hating this and despising that. We still have some kind of a parade every time anyone makes an effort to do something. We live in a state of constant objection. Not every change is objectionable because it hazards our little private way of trying to achieve wealth. If it interferes with doing exactly as we please, it is criminal. But what we are going, going to find someday is that nature is going to step in and tell us we cannot do exactly what we please. We can't make mistake after mistake, forget about it, deny it, or try to prove it's right when we know it's wrong. We are in a condition now where we have to begin to change these patterns. Now, to Bacon, these changes were not just philosophical. They were scientific. The changes that we must make are just as real as the law of gravity. They're just as factual as any physical scientific institution can produce. They are facts that are proven to us in the great laboratory of the world. 
the laboratory that has been carrying on its experiments for more than 10,000 years of recorded history. The great laboratory is the world, and the proof of what is being done is the result it has upon the world. And the world now being in poor condition is a proof that the method is not correct. So Bacon decided and definitely made possible a realization of the method. The method by means of which uh, we can solve our problems. The method is very simple. Do not do that which is hurtful to anything. Do not live for your own personal profit alone. Do not live for your own satisfaction alone. We have now a series of problems. Narcotics, alcohol to be two, and uh, the two powerful ones. And yet many of the people that are suffering from these ailments do not want to change. They have the inalienable right to destroy themselves if they want to. Now this is something that cannot necessarily be equated in terms of law, order, imprisonment, judgment, and these things. The problems are definitely that the human being has an inalienable right, he feels, to do as he pleases. And he has not yet learned that if he does what he pleases without correcting his mistakes, he is going to end in absolute abject misery. So it becomes time to look into the causes of the thing. And Bacon found out a long time ago that the cause of the whole thing is something inside of the human being, which we call egoism or egotism. It is the irresistible desire to do exactly what we please. That when we want to hate, we will hate. When we want to fight, we will fight. And when someone else sells us a deal of fighting because they want to take over a country, we all help them do it. These things are part of an uncontrollable determination to make the mistakes we want to make. I know I've worked with a good many alcoholics along the way, and mo most of them have come to the point where they, to have a drink is more important than to live. And they are perfectly willing to die, usually with delirium tremens and some other unpleasant symptoms, rather than change. And in the narcotics problems today, we find that the uh, cocaine, for example, that those who use it say that while they have a high, they are ten feet high. They rule the world. They can do everything. And when they are not under the influence of the narcotic, they can't live with themselves or anybody else. They are suddenly helpless people, too small for the world in which they live. So they take narcotics in order to feel great. Well... It would also seem as though this is pretty obvious, that something is basically wrong. Now, we have many people who are trying to do something about it, but they've run against another problem, namely that narcotics are profitable, and profit is the final determination. It, if it is a cause of wealth for someone, there is, no, there is always someone who wants to make that wealth even if it's over the bodies of the dead he has killed. So this is the funny place, a sad place, a tragic place, where we are now. Yet in the presence of this, we have more assets than any time in the history of the world. We have tremendous potentials. There's hardly anything that needs doing that we can't do. The only difficulty is... We just don't want to interfere with the smug little way we have to live. The individual is afraid of losing its job. If the present condition goes along as it is now, everyone will lose their job. Nature is trying to tell us something. Nature is a very patient parent. It is seeking desperately to make us realize that this world, this universe, is ruled by law and order. 
that the laws of nature cannot be violated by man with impunity. That when we go against nature, we go against survival. And that there is no amount of bribery by means of which we can bribe natural law. And all efforts to change it for our own advantage without outgrowing our disadvantages, all such efforts are fruitful. Now we are coming to a point with nearly, a little probably now a little over, five billion people here. Five billion people, for the most part, frightened, confused, and in the midst of turmoil, war, plague, pestilence, our little friend who took care of the African pygmies for a long time, a fine man, told me that the bubonic plague has broken out in Africa. Now, it probably won't go far, that's true. We have methods of curbing it. But here in the 20th century, we are seeing the ills arise that we fought desperately against in the 10th century. And we have not caused changes that, uh, that add up to solution. We keep right on making the same mistake we made before. We are still frightened to death of the Turk and the Comet and the Plague, exactly in that order. Now we're afraid of the uh, planets, the stars that explode somewhere in the far vistas of space. We're afraid of everything because some way we realize we have built no security into ourselves or our world. So we have to do something, but we can just do most of the things we're doing now, and if we try hard, and we work sincerely, and we wish all well that we can, and we get together and try to make better laws and better rules, all these things are helpful. There's no question about it. But each individual who belongs to that type of hope must work on himself. He must not assume that any political system is going to make a good person bad or a bad person good. The individual has his virtues, his integrities, his values in himself from the moment he is born. In fact, he has brought them with him from previous by embodiment. He is no longer uh, unequipped. He has the resources. He has exactly what is necessary to him. And he also has the power to control himself if he wants to. The excesses of the day are habit forming. We are doing the things that we think are the most comfortable because we like to assume that if we keep on going, we will finally achieve the peace and the security we want to, to see uh, receive. But uh, this the whole problem is very, very shaky. Uh, we actually, we must realize that the great struggle for wealth that began long ago is still with us. Croesus was the ancient king who was supposed to have been the richest man who ever lived. And a philosopher, who probably didn't have much more than the coat he was wearing, uh, was talking with this king one day, and Croesus pointed out to him all the wealth of gold and jewels and precious things in his treasuries. And the philosopher looked at him for a moment and said, Yes, you have all these things, but a man with better iron can take them all away from you. And this is what we've been doing, trying to get better iron, trying to fight these things this way, trying to take over somebody else's wealth or try to hold on to our own. The problem of material gain is frustrated by something that we cannot beat, and that is that we're not permanent residents here at this time. In a few years, uh, what we have is going to be separated from us. Now this does not mean that we shouldn't have what we need and a reasonable amount of security. But it means that the fantasy of great conglomerates of power with individuals sacrificing love, friendship, honor, and everything for something that they must in a very short time 
leave as a heritage to someone else who perhaps will no, do no better with it than they did. The whole idea that the material world is permanent, that we can build empires, all this is a delusion this has been, which has arisen as a result of a kind of spiritual ignorance that mankind has suffered from always. This idea that here is where we should do bigger and better things. We should do better things, but not necessarily bigger ones. What we need to do definitely is to prepare ourselves to be citizens of eternity, a citizen of a world that is far greater than any wealth that we can possibly possess. Actually, our wealth is very transitory. Our power is very ephemeral. A few days ago, a citizen of the one major nation who had served it for many years retired. He had been, had every high office that the country could give him, and then he decided that it was enough. So he simply stepped down of his own accord and decided to go back and spend the rest of his life as a gentleman farmer. This is an experience we all have to face that all this, the power and glory and everything, is not what we are really looking for. The family is not going to be better because all the members are making high salaries. It's better when they are happy people, constructive people, expressing the higher emotions and desires of life. Bacon was one of those who believed that science was capable of unselfish love that all this intellectualism was merely a kind of protection against a minor hurt of one kind or another, but that all knowledge is based in the fact that truth is worthy of our affection, that the truthful are the truly loving, and that everything that we do that is right makes more friendship, better relationships, and helps to enrich our daily experiences with each other. Everyone who wants to go out and try to help the world at this time should also be very much dedicated to the idea of correcting in himself the faults he objects to in society. If he thinks too many people are selfish, then he had best look himself over carefully to make sure that he isn't, because in many cases he will find that he has more selfishness than he realizes. But of course he kind of gets over it himself. He, he has a kind of selfishness that has a beautiful quality about it, whereas other people's selfishness is not nearly so beautiful. So selfishness, selfishness is justifiable in the person who thinks he is doing well, but it is not. Here we have now organizations springing up everywhere of people who want to get back to facts and who realize that unless we do something, we're not going to get back to facts. And the uh, effort to grow is wonderful, but it should definitely have two objectives. One, to help the world to grow, and the other, to make sure that we grow. Now, growth in this case, case has no relationship to bodily or material advantages. Growth is not to have more. It is to be more as a living being. Growth is to have a greater insight, a greater internal resolution, a broader and deeper vision of the purpose of things. And without this inner maturing, the exterior has no defense. If we do not live from the inside, then we will be the victims of our own material attitudes, and they are the ones that are giving us trouble. So I think we should realize that whenever we join movements, whenever we unite our efforts in some religious dedication, that the moment we dedicate our lives to any improvement, we must start improving ourselves. That we must be worthy of greater insight. That we must be worthy of a source within ourselves of insights and integrities. Now, as we change ourselves, the miracle occurs. 
a miracle that cannot come from books or conversations, the miracle of our own value sense changing, the miracle that we, by means of which we begin to have a positive instruction from inside of ourselves, that we transfer leadership to the internal life. And this means we give it to the eternal part of our own beings. We turn the leadership of our daily conduct over to our ideals and our integrities, rather than trying to adjust these ideals to the temporal excesses of those around us. So with the correction of our own mistakes, a broader, deeper foundation for integrities gradually builds within us. It does not become so necessary for us to depend upon outside things. It becomes more and more possible for the individual to have the light of his lantern inside of himself. In the, in the ninth card of the tarot deck, the hermit carries the lantern under the folds of his robe. And the lantern is not an open light. It is not a candle. It is a lantern because the light must be protected. If the uh, light is not protected, the winds of change and circumstances can blow it out. And it is very important, therefore, that the light of truth within ourselves be protected against those factors by means of which it could be extinguished. One of the philosophers of old made the very nice statement that was really quite an important point, he says. There is not enough darkness in the entire universe to put out the light of a single candle. And what we need is that this single candle be in ourselves. And we protect it by building it as a lantern. We protect it with our minds, our emotions, and our bodies. These are all instruments for protection of integrities. They are all means of defending value against this changing atmosphere of storm and, and, and conflict. We know definitely that there, there are winds, there are moods, there are all kinds of things that attack the light if it is an open candle. But if it is protected, then through the protection it is given support and integrity. On the other hand, sometimes the lantern gets, the glass of the lantern gets badly obscured. Dust and dirt assemble on the outside of the lantern, and this prevents the light from shining out. If, therefore, the body and the personal habits of the individual compromise the light of the lantern, they can cause this lantern to lose its radiance or be reduced. The light will still be there, but it will not shine as it should. And this, again, is a part of a symbolism that we find in many ancient systems. A very, very famous old uh, Dutch uh, emblem writer, Father Katz, Jacob Katz, in the uh, 17th century, uh, wrote a marvelous book of emblems, pictures of a mysterious spiritual nature, and emblems are intended to lure the inner life out from its depths by showing it pictures of itself on the outside. Kind of cute idea, too. But really, the point is, one of Cat's emblems is an old man holding a lantern. And he is passing the lantern across an, an open grave to a young man on the other side. The passing on of the lamp. And that is the name that he gave his symbol. And that was the name that Bacon gave his concept. And the old man is now believed to be a figure of an ancient and wise person, Dr. John Dee, who was counselor of Queen Elizabeth I. He was a very wise man. He knew Bacon. And uh, also he was a part of those who were to carry on the lamp. Now, in those days, to carry on the light was a matter of great discretion. And all of Bacon's works are very carefully and discreetly presented, 
so as not to destroy uh, their value or endanger the survival of those who tried to live by them. The carrying on of the lamp, therefore, was done in secret. It was not necessary to parade your virtues, because actually to parade your virtues is a form of egotism, and that is not permissible. The point is that the improvement of the individual does not necessarily endanger his social position. The improvement of the person is not something that is going to cause him to be strange or weird or uh, uh, difficult. The only thing that gets that type of a reputation is when he talks too much and says the wrong things. Then he can make all kinds of enemies or be regarded as l lacking in mental s uh, security. But the individual who grows quietly becomes a little better person every day does not really need to be persecuted or need to fear it. He will not be persecuted because in most cases when he starts to do nice things he'll make new friends. People will like him better. And those who do not agree with him will never have the chance to, to disagree with him. He will live his life from within himself with a dedication as though he was t before the altar of his God and dedicating his life to the service of the truths which he holds sacred. Now it may be that his truth as he holds it sacred may not be absolute at the time he makes his dedication. He may de dedicate himself to truths he believes in which, which someday will not prove to be true. But they are the best he knows, the fullest and deepest and kindest of his, all his thoughts and of his intentions. So if he is not correct and he is honor honorable and dedicated these things will correct themselves. Plato was a philosopher for most of his 80 years, and he was a great scholar. But in the last years of his life, he said there is only one advantage in philosophy, and that is that it builds a foundation under faith. Faith has to be supported in some way. Philosophy supports it from the outside, and internal growth supports it from the inside. And these two supports will protect it against all the problems of, the, of life. Actually, the thing we seek is a very simple thing. It is largely summed up in the term peace. What we want is true peace, not a peace which is an arbitration between battles but a peace that is a full expression of our acceptance of life and our appreciation of all the good things that exist and a quiet determination to grow every day. Peace is therefore tranquility in relationship to the parts of ourselves. Peace is something that we attain inwardly and which smooths the outer surfaces of things and makes them pleasant and kindly and does not in hardly in any case that you can imagine complicate life. It simplifies it. And it simplifies it because this peace is not something you try to pass on to someone else. All you can do is help them to find it in themselves in their own way. But having found it, you set an example which will lure many others into an effort at self-improvement. So peace is the end of all of it, and peace is reunion of man with the divine source of himself. Peace is the final establishment of absolute, absolute harmony between the individual and the eternal source of his own existence. Peace must come, and we must all make peace with God. And we make peace with God by simply obeying the rules and recognizing that the divine parenthood of things is vested in powers beyond and above all our material and physical addictions. We must therefore try to find that, that peace which simply comes so easily. Just all you have to do is forgive an enemy a little bit and you already feel a lot better. It isn't some great big thing. It's to get rid of the negative, nagging uh, mistakes with which we burden our existence. 
We get rid of the excitement of change. We get tired of condemning things. We gradually work around to living a better life. We live a life in which kindness is our religion. Kindness in serving, kindness in giving, kindness in accepting. We all have to work together for one purpose, to find out what was intended for man and do it. We all live in a universe of absolute laws. There are no peculiarities, no vicarious atonements, no excuses in nature. But there is no hardness there. There is no cruelty. There is no determination of viciousness about natural law. It is simply the simple, normal thing. It is something that little bugs and bees seem to get along with better than human beings. It is something that is inevitable, but the inevitable for man is not the same as the inevitable for the bugs and the bees. We have a destiny for which our own composite, very complicated organism has prepared us. We have been spending ages in putting this body together. We have done a great deal of study and growth in the mere process of suffering, dying, and being born again, in the means of understanding this composite constitution of ourselves. We know we have received a living instrument that is the most remarkable and wonderful thing that we can experience or know or, or see or work with. We take ourselves for granted. We do not realize the tremendous potential that has brought us to where we are now which has made us the most extraordinary creatures that we know anywhere in our experience or study of life. We have a great background, but we need to put it together. We need to make the foreground bear witness to the real background, not to the wars and the panics and the plagues, but to the constant growth of powers within ourselves, the power to think, the power to love, the power to share, the power to believe and the power to search through the mysterious substances of life to find a union with God as the ultimate of all man's searching. And we are assured that the divine plan prepares us for this, that it is the intent, but that salvation, like every other good thing, has to be earned. And the earning of salvation is far more important than the earning of a few dollars on the stock exchange. The problem is the individual is now looking everywhere for new ways of trying to solve problems. And he must not forget that he must get over his own grievances. There must be no more prejudices. There must be no more antagonisms. There must be no more criticisms. And where problems are not right, it is not for us to stand and condemn them but to do everything we possibly can to right them. Always ever working constructively. And every constructive action is a contribution to the solution of the human need. We need uh, to find also another thing that somehow gets away and has uh, made a lot of the trouble we're in. And that is we've got to get away from selfishness. Selfishness doesn't seem like a very big problem. Everybody's a little bit selfish, they tell me. It isn't that, that that makes it so important. It is that selfishness permits us to exploit each other. Selfishness that permits the, even the parent to neglect the child. It permits the individual to neglect the normal duties of life. It enables him to go through life uh, only thinking of his own advantages. Selfishness is probably the most common and the most simple of our own weaknesses, our own failings. Yet selfishness or self-centeredness becomes the basis of tyrannies that extend to war, war after war, generation after generation. Selfishness is something that is in every family. There's always something there. Selfishness is the competition in families. It is the com competition in society. Self-interest has destroyed most of the world. And the development of a 
lack of self-interest in which it goes to sleep in the common interest of the common good. When this happens, we will all be a great deal further along. So as we read new books that come out about how to solve some of these problems and how to work with them, we do recognize and revere and appreciate all the good things people do and try to do. And we applaud much those who have decided to try to lead others to a better way of life, that they are working to build a better brotherhood of man, finding ways to overcome war, overcome crime, take care of narcotics and juvenile delinquency, take care of poverty and race prejudice. All these things are under consideration, and rightly so. But with all these different things that we're trying to do, and in which we are uniting our efforts in so many uh, gentle and kindly ways, let us never forget to work on ourselves, to make sure that any cause that we, see, that we sponsor as desirable has already been made right in our own lives. That if we want but parents to take care of their children, let us be sure that we take care of ours. If we think that uh, various prejudices are detrimental, let us be sure that we do not carry any of those prejudices in ourselves. And if we have any unreasonable ambitions, if we are willing to compromise principles for profit, or do not use what we have wisely, then we should begin at the present time. People have different amounts and different ways and different conditions in which to labor. Uh, those who have great means have to administer it wisely. The continued accumulation of wealth without use is a sin against life. Everything that we need to do and which we see is necessary, and we point to it and say, this must change. Let us also, for a moment at least, sit very quiet and say to ourselves, is there anything of this kind in our own lives? Are we telling the world to change something we haven't changed? Are we unable to actually live the things that we, we believe? In religion, we uh, think we are religious, but religion is not theology. Theology makes us join a church. A religion makes us share with all others veneration for truth and God. And the moment we get really religious, sectarianism fades away. And it is no longer our faith against somebody else's faith. It's God's truth for us all. And everywhere we gradually outgrow these stumbling blocks, these mistakes. And when we do this, something rather nice happens. The inside of our lives quietens down. We don't waste any more energy because of the fact that peace helps to keep us healthy. Discord helps to tear us down. And every time we get anger, or excited, or irritable, some little part of our own body suffers. It is as though a great tornado sweeps through the body when we have a temper fit. All these problems of quieting down the inner side is wonderful, because if we get quiet enough, if we become silent enough in our side, inside ourselves, we then understand the statement in the Bible, be still and know that I am God. We have to learn to be still. And that means the end of prejudice, the end of conceit, the end of arrogance, the end of unreasonable selfishness in all its branches. Be still and know that we are God. And only when we are at peace with ourselves can we know God inside of ourselves as the source of peace. The way that leads to deity is always a way of quietude. No one ever stormed the gates of heaven. We have come quietly back to our Father's house. We have come back to the source of ourselves, gentle, kindly, and understanding. And as we become more kindly in those ways, as long as we begin to correct our own mistakes, we will observe some remarkable changes in society. We will discover for our joy and benefit that as more and more people make their own lives organized in way of service to others, the better everything becomes. And the people who 
are now trying very hard will not only try with all their hearts and souls but the divine eternal truth within them will become their guardian, their guide, and their protection in time of trouble. We must develop more of this kindly life of service, this gentle realization that the universe is a beautiful thing, not simply something that has to be conquered periodically, that we are here to use nature, that we have been given a garden and have turned it into a desert. We, but the seeds are still there, and a little water, and a little human kindness, and the desert will blossom as a rose. So all these, it all works back into ourselves. And Bacon says that the passing on of the light, or the passing on of the, of the great tree, tree, key to the method, is learning and sold by dedication to right use. That everything we learn, everything we know, is a new responsibility for integrity and a new opportunity for service. When we begin to understand that very thoroughly and live accordingly, uh, situations get pretty fair, and we will have more energy, less sickness, and we'll find this life much more agreeable, useful, and enlightened. And I'm sure that's what we are all trying to accomplish. And I think we are beginning to realize more and more just how the job has to be done. Well, I guess that's it for the morning, but I'd like to call attention to the fact that my wife's meeting at 1.30 this afternoon uh, is going to be devoted to the subject of education and re-education. And uh, a number of cards have been given out, and uh, the meeting will be uh, at 1.30 this afternoon here, and I'm sure many of you might be interested in attending and seeing the very remarkable approach that she has uh, to these problems of life. Ones that I, and approaches that I think would also very much help you to be quiet in times of stress. We hope some of you will be here this afternoon. Thank you very much.